tonight's uh, lecture, which is, as you see over here, uh, we finished the war with its uh, funny results, uh, you know, good and bad, as we'll talk about, especially in terms of the borders. But uh, while the fighting is going on, so uh, there's the new state and the politics, immigration, and economics, and, and the Arabs. They're right in the middle of all that. And tonight's uh, lecture is being sponsored, as you see, by Steve Sharp, his family, memory of his dad. Uh, I never met him, but based on what he told me, it was easy to see that he's a passionate Arab Israel Jew. Uh, we all are familiar with the American Jew, I'm serious about this, who had this relationship to this side of Jewish tradition, that's a, that's a, but it comes to Israel, especially the generation that grew up fully cognizant of the fragility of uh, Israel's existence, um, constant need to uh, help out, uh, knows exactly the type of person I'm talking about, but to do a better job than I could ever do, I want to call on Steve to say a few words uh, tonight about the person in whose memory this is being sponsored. Very few. I'm not, I'm here. I'm not bad at you. Don't you sit down. If I fall asleep, you just no, sit down. down. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I am delighted. This, this is my competitor. We're both in the business of putting people to sleep, but he gets, he gets paid more than I do. <laughs> you tell that to the University of Maryland. <laughs> uh, at any rate, I, I'm really uh, delighted and touched with the opportunity to sponsor this lecture. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, my wife, my daughter, my son-in-law, and my son are here. Uh, they knew my father. I know nobody else did. My father was uh, a scion, if you will, of the, one of the early Jewish families to move up to Spring Valley, New York. Some of you heard of Spring Valley. There you go. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and just post-World War I, a bunch of them moved up and established before there was Muncie. You all know there was Spring Valley. Uh, and he spent most of his life, uh, virtually all of his life, except for a brief stint in the Army and a very brief stint with his new in-laws. Um, in Rockland County, uh, and he was one of the f sort of uh, pillars of the community. I just have to tell you, in regards to the state of Israel, Rabbi Katz actually hit the nail on the head. Uh, they were very cognizant of, of how delicate the situation was uh, post-Holocaust, how it was that Israel really, and, and we've heard in this lecture series, was sort of hanging by a thread at every moment and they felt they needed to do everything they could. I, I remember as a kid in my house, there was always some meeting of some Zionist organization. Some Israeli author was coming by to give a, a brief talk. There was always some, some fundraising going on. My parents were always at the, at the forefront of all these. And the only thing I will share with you is that after my father retired during the last 15, 20 years of his life, he became the passionate defender of the state of Israel in the pages of the Rockland Journal News, which is the local paper in Rockland County. If somebody dared write an article critical of Israel, an op-ed piece, or a letter to the editor, he would flash out his word processor, because he knew how to use that, and he would send a, a suitable letter to the editor. He even engaged, he was, the editor got so tired of hearing him after a while, he asked him to, to write a couple op-ed op pieces. Uh, he even got involved in some uh, rather heated exchanges with letter write writers who dared respond to him. Uh, he also had a number of letters he did not send, and I'm glad he didn't. <laughs> and that was the passion part. At any rate, so I'm, I'm just going to say that, that that was my father, and I, he would have been absolutely delighted uh, that this lecture series is going on, and I'm sure somewhere his neshama is taking great satisfaction from the fact that, uh, that this is being done in his name. Thank you, Rabbi. I told you. Now, um, let's get down to work. The uh, new uh, map of Israel, okay, uh, forget this one, but we all know this map, and this was the partition lines, and if you recall, don't have it in front of you, but the final map is that Israel got this, and this, and a little bit along here, remember the bulge out to, to Jerusalem. Uh, it's not a lot, and the borders are all screwball. Uh, this is Israel's existential problem till today. If the people who want to put pressure on Israel to withdraw from all the territories are successful, and one never knows what the current political situation, 
Uh, then they're going to go back to what's called the ideal 1967 borders that you hear all along the line. That's what President Obama said the other day. And um, you're going to end up with this screwball situation. The borders uh, were a big problem and the most uh, complicated and, I think, a negative legacy of the 48-49 uh, war. Tonight I want to talk not so much about the political map, I mean the, the, the uh, geographical boundaries uh, so much, as uh, kind of the political shape of the new state, because Israel, as, you, as was said before, came through on a thread and through all kind of unusual, <laughs> unexpected uh, situations. And the human factor is, of course, always so important in all of this. But uh, it's the first Jewish state, of course. But as we all know, it wasn't only a Jewish state, but they want to make a democratic one, which sounds great in theory, but how you put that into practice, what kind of democracy are we talking about? But it's interesting. Uh, I need not tell you, it's the only democracy in the Middle East and basically the only one in Asia besides India or maybe Japan. And uh, that's kind of interesting. And we're talking all the way back from day one. It's not like the Jewish people have a tradition of democracy. In the ancient times, you had kings and things like this. And I would say anyone who surveys Jewish history in general, particularly the period of the first temple and the second temple, will come to the conclusion that we Jews do not, I repeat, do not have a particular genius for politics. Uh, we may have in other areas, but we didn't do too great in terms of organizing our statehood and our government so well. Uh, that's more of an Anglo-Saxon kind of a thing. But in the 20th century, they were committed to doing this, and they did do it. But therein lies the uh, rub, because if you're talking about democracy, so what kind? Basically, the two types are the Anglo-Saxon on the one hand and the continental European on the other. Uh, the other countries in the world don't have any democracies. True? You look around the world, in the different continents, there aren't any. And the few democracies that exist outside of Europe are based on one or another kind of European model. It's either the Anglo-Saxon model, as far as I can tell anyway, or the uh, continental European one. France, uh, Germany, Central Europe, Holland, Scandinavia, places like that. Um, that's going to be a big question, the way Israel is going to go. The, as far as the period we're concerned, perhaps the most interesting aspect of all this is what was called the provisional government. You see, when Israel started and became a state, they didn't have a democracy because they didn't have a vote. It's interesting that what happened was that the political parties precede the state. The state of Israel is kind of interesting in the fact that it was actually created by the Zionist parties, as we've seen here uh, this year and in previous years. Uh, they started a movement. They somehow or other finagled their way into Palestine, and they somehow or other finagled their way that they should get a state. Uh, all created by the different parties who are constantly bickering and fighting with each other. And uh, they didn't have time during all the fighting and the wars that we've been going through over here to have an election and all the rest of it. And instead, what happened was that the powers that be, the parties themselves, so let's skip the elections and let's just declare government until the war's over and then we'll have a chance to do a regular election, which is what they did. I'm not talking about cheating. I'm just saying this is what they had to do. And so if you um, go to the... Uh, uh, famous scenes, as we all know, of uh, when Ben-Gurion proclaims the state in uh, 1948. There's the, I was just there the other day, uh, back in Independence Hall, which is the old museum. They have their Dizengoff's house. All these guys that are coming in, and a second later you'll see uh, Ben-Gurion and the others, uh, they're simply the different leaders of the parties who said, for the moment, let's just go together and call ourselves a provisional government, even though we weren't elected run the war, and when it's over, then we'll figure out what to do. And if you look at, the, if you go there right now, the head table in, um, in Tel Aviv, uh, you see it's a small group. Uh, if you go to Independence Hall right now, for example, today, uh, you'll see they have it sort of reenacted. There's Ben Green coming in, of course, into the room. It's not a big room. I'm sure many people here have been there one time or another. And uh, there's the Rabbi Maimon from the Mizrahi, and there's uh, Chaim Shapir from the Mizrahi, and one over is Moshe Shered from the Mapai party, and over here is somebody from the Mapam party. No, it was like a half a dozen or, or, uh, or seven or eight or nine different parties, and each one had one or two posts in the government. This guy's the foreign minister, this guy's the minister of transportation, and that guy's that. And the point is they have a cabinet, and even though there's no election, every party is kind of represented, or at least the majority of them, including the Agoda, for example who's a member of the provisional government, interestingly. And uh, they're the guys who, do, who, who take the votes and pass the laws and the uh, executive decisions to run the war. So from May 48 till um, January of 49, that's uh, seven months, 
uh, in a very packed seven months, I'm sure you would agree. Uh, Israel didn't have elections. These are, as I see, these people at the table over here are different, different famous leaders from the different political party, and there aren't many of them either. There's about a dozen people at that whole table. And uh, one's from the General Zionist Party, one's from the Mapam Party, one is from the Progressive Party, as they said before. We'll talk about the different parties that are there in a minute at the beginning of the State of Israel, but it's a charismatic and not an institutional kind of authority. And um, charismatic means that everybody who's in the yeshuv, in the Jewish uh, you know, uh, community of Palestine, which is now becoming the State of Israel, is going to feel that somehow or other they're represented at the table. The historians call this corporatism. It's the old medieval model in which, you know, in the old cities, every interest group is represented formally. The butchers have a stake at the uh, city council table, the bakers, the candlestick makers, the merchants, the clergy, and all the rest of it. So you're also everyone that represented the uh, body politic of the Jewish community, the 650,000 Jews in Palestine, somebody's on there, and that's how they uh, vote. Ben-Gurion dominates it, but nevertheless, everybody's got to vote. And that's why, uh, as I said before, if you'll, uh, you know, I'm not going to, Right in front of here, you don't see it, but uh, there are the people sitting at the table, and here they're sitting out this way, a whole bunch of people, Golda Meir is sitting in a chair out here, all the rest. If you go there today, you can see the chairs, and they have the people's names on it, and what's really cool is that uh, even the communists and the Agudas Yisrael, notice both of them are, for different reasons, not Zionist, uh, both of them ideologically reject, in principle, Zionism, correct? That's what they are. The Agudas Yisrael from the right, the communists from the left, both of them are, in principle, opposed to Zionism. Nevertheless, they're in the room. They signed the Declaration of Independence. They're in the government, or at least the communists weren't, but the Akuta was. And it's sort of like, in the old days, many hold that Ezra and the Chemi, back in the time when they constituted the Antik and a famous opinion, which is said before by uh, Margolis Yom, is that uh, I'm sure many of you know that the reason Israel calls it a Knesset is because the ancient Anshe Knesset Agadola, which by tradition must be 120 people. But the famous question is, I thought the Sanhedrin is 70 or 71, so where'd you get 120 from? Fair point. And, you know, nobody knows the exact answer, but a very famous answer that was offered back in the 1920s or 30s by a big time of was uh, the following. And it's very similar to what we're looking at over here. Here's Ezra coming back, leading the Jews after seven years in exile, more or less, and uh, they want to reconstitute a Sanhedrin, a government, as we would call it. Uh, it's supposed to be the 70 greatest scholars or something like that. Who's the 70 greatest? You leaving me off? You leaving him off? What, the Chabad's not under? The, uh, the good of the Mizrahi, the this one, the that one, the... So Ezra's like, it's put everybody on. No, no, no. It's, 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 it's wise. It's wise. Because the main point is to get everybody in the, on the table. Afterwards, we'll sort it out. And so, uh, let's go to the next uh, slide. It's, it was just interesting. Right in front of Ben-Gurion, if you, if you go to the pl place, is uh, sitting this guy opposite this guy. He's the uh, head of the Aguda. He's the head of the Communist Party. All right? You understand what I'm saying? He, uh, let's say where I'm sitting, I'm Ben-Gurion, proclaiming the state. Right in front of me over here are different people sitting. And right here is the Aguda representative. This is a uh, cousin of Mosey Truoft. And, uh, and this is not. And the... Uh, <coughs> Right, uh, and, and I'll say it again. If you if you look today, I mean it's no secret. If you look on the Declaration of Independence of Israel, it's signed by, among others, representatives from the Agoda as well as all the Zionist parties, and of this guy who was the official representative of the Communist Party, Stalinist Party. But nevertheless, he considered himself part of the Jewish community to that degree. It'll go sour very quickly. But do recall that in May and June and July of '48, when Israel was fighting for its life. It might be a little bit funny, but the communists were allies. And Israel could not have fought the war without getting the weapons from Czechoslovakia. And they couldn't get the weapons from Czechoslovakia if the Israeli communists didn't use their uh, contacts to uh, hook up with the, the Israeli communists, with the Czechoslovakian communists, and make the whole thing work. Now, I know what happened later was bad, but I'm just telling you, facts are facts. So politics, as we all know, make strange bedfellows. And I'm totally trying to show this to you to show you how complicated it is to set up a democracy, including all different parts, in a country uh, like Israel. And the provisional government is pretty doggone effective. <coughs> they do prosecute, excuse me, they, they fight the war. And more or less they win. I mean, like I said before, there's problems of the choices they made at the end, in my opinion, and I think history will bear it out. But nevertheless, uh, they beat back the Arabs. 
uh, they started taking in the Aliyah, and they started making things work. So even though they're not elected, but they're an effective uh, government. And the point is that the whole Jewish public went along with it. Nobody got up there and said, the emperor has no clothes. Nobody got up there and said, who elected you guys, or anything like that. So that means they had charismatic authority. And at the end of the day, politics is about charismatic authority. Right? If the public, the, the great advantage of democracy, like America, is you have 300 million some people who all say, I may like Obama, I may not like Obama, but he's the president of the United States, he's got the right to be there, or Bush, or whoever it is. Now that's something that, believe me, many dictators around the world would love to have, but cannot have. Right? Uh, don't you think that the dictator of Syria at right this moment dreams, can't even dream of such a thing? So legitimacy, charismatic authority, acceptance of your right to be in charge is pretty doggone important, and the Jews in uh, the provisional government do undertake to do this, and they carry it out. So it's kind of interesting in this regard. Now, what happens next in terms of politics is very interesting. Maybe you don't know this. According to the United Nations Partition Resolution, back in November of 47, the way it actually said, if you take the trouble to read it, is there'll be two states in Palestine. One will be a Jewish one, one will be an Arab one. Here's what's going to happen. The two states will declare their independence or something like that, and then they will appoint, a constant, they will elect uh, constituent assemblies so that the Jewish state, for example, and the Arab state will have elections for a constitutional convention, like you had in America, the Constitutional Convention back in the 1780s. And then these constitutional conventions, once they're democratically elected, will assemble and they'll debate and argue it out and they'll produce a constitution. And the UN even said it'll have to be a liberal constitution guaranteeing freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and all that stuff. And then, once that's done, it'll be submitted to the people and be ratified by a vote, and then those will be the constitutions of the new states. The, 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 the Israelis will have their constitution, the Palestinian Arabs will have their constitution, and as I said before, it'll be genuine democracy, and everybody will live happily ever after. That's what's said. <laughs> um, first of all, as we all know, the Palestinian state did not happen. Okay. Uh, Palestinians totally lost. Uh, the Grand Mufti, that was their hero, he got completely displaced, and by the time it's all over, uh, the bulk of Palestine, the Arab part, is annexed to uh, the Kingdom of Jordan. Abdullah took it over. Uh, Abdullah had his own constitution, if you want to call it that, but he did, uh, but it's not the one that the United Nations called for. The Gaza Strip is under the Egyptian military control. Uh, the Arabs in Gaza want it that way, but I'm saying they don't end up having a Palestinian state either. So that half never happened. What about the Jewish half? Also never happened. Does Israel have a constitution today? No. What happened? So in January, after the fighting was mainly over, if you follow what I said before I went to Israel, uh, by December and early January, they were beating the Egyptians bad. I was just in the Negev the other day. We drove right near Nitsana, where the big battle was. And uh, the Egyptians sued for armistice terms. That's at the very, very beginning of January. And by the second week or so of January, there are already formal uh, negotiations being held under the United Nations auspices and roads uh, to have an armistice, not a, God forbid, not a peace treaty. He says, uh, armistice between Egypt and, and Israel. And so the mood in Israel is, now we have a little bit of a respite, and uh, the Jordanians aren't going to attack us, as I tried to explain last time. They were scared when anyone else said, the Lebanese are not going to attack us, and the Iraqi army's pulling out. We can't have an election. And so in January 25, I think, they hold their first elections in Israel, but it's supposed to be an election for a constituent assembly. And the idea is that all the parties will compete, and then they'll get whatever they get, let's say 120, and then those 120 will be the Constitutional Convention. They'll meet in Tel Aviv. You're not allowed to meet in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, according to the United Nations, was an international city. Okay? But they'll meet in Tel Aviv. They'll debate like America did in the 1780s. And they'll come up with a constitution, which, of course, will include all the provisions of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, freedom of press, and all that kind of business. And the essential feature of a constitution, of course, is what? To provide some kind of formal limitation on the power of the government. Isn't that true? That's what the constitution is there for, to have rules and regulations and procedures. And this is what the government is permitted to do, and this is the government is not permitted to do. And then once they have that, uh, worked out in Tel Aviv, then they'll submit it to a national election, you know, to the Israeli people, and they'll vote it up or down. That does not happen, because as soon as the 120 get together in Tel Aviv, uh, Ben Gurion says, "I got a great idea. Let's declare ourselves to Knesset." 
Huh? Let's just be the government and skip all that constitution talk. And everybody says yes. <laughs> right? And that's how it happened. Uh, there are one or two people, including, interestingly, Peter Bergson. Remember him from last year? The guy was... So he was, he was uh, elected with Begin on the Khairut party in the first election. You understand? Uh, when Menachem Begin set up, they got 14 seats out of 120. And one of them was with Hillel Cook. That's his real name. Uh, Peter Bergson. He said, this is, a con- this is a constitutional assembly. This is not a national government. And everybody said, yeah, I know, but you know. <laughs> We're here. <laughs> The show, the show, the show will run uh, fine without it, you know, and, uh, and and it'll go. And this happened in February of. Uh, so bottom line is like this: like politicians everywhere, they cheat and they just declared themselves the government, and that's what they've been until uh, today. The main reason for this was not simply to cheat. Uh, ben Gurion, and I think many people at that time was uh, not in, the one thing he was not interested in was the essential function of a constitution, which is probably the limitations on the power of the government. In 1949, what Ben-Gurion did not want was any limitations on the power of the government. They're still fighting a war. they got a large Arab minority, as you'll see in a minute. They have other issues. And uh, his idea of democracy was the following. I'm serious about this. His idea of democracy is you have elections every three, four years. Uh, you have uh, you know, basic freedoms and all that. And it is real fair elections. But then whoever's in the government is a dictator. You get it? All power to the government. It's a very Marxist kind of notion of the use called democratic centralism. Uh, there are the elections. The legitimacy is, is afforded by the fact that there are genuine elections. Okay? There's no attempt to deny that. But once you do, if you have in Israel 120 seats, so 61 is the magic number, correct? 51%. So 60, whoever gets 61 seats can do whatever they want, and there should be untrammeled a kind of democratic dictatorship, that there should be no issues if they want to arrest somebody and keep them in jail or, or you know, issue a, a, a crazy taxes or do a, a bug of people's phones or whatever is necessary to do as they call for the national uh, security should be allowed to do it. This is the British style. That's the British government. And very famously, England has never had a constitution. They're not looking for one. And the British government has always had, if they wish, if they wish. British government has full power to do whatever they want, provided they get it passed in Parliament. Um, I recall, I think I mentioned here once, in, in 1940 when Churchill took over, and it was a real uh, crisis, uh, the Parliament passed a law at that time which said, like, it's all people and all property are now at the immediate and total disposal of His Majesty's government. Which means that if the government wants to do anything, take your house away, use this, draft this, take that away, they have the right to do it. Now, the assumption was they're not going to cheat. Okay. The basic assumption was not going to abuse it, not going to start taking everyone's rights away. And that was the same thing in Israel. Uh, the basic assumption was, yeah, there's not going to be any actual Bill of Rights, and there still isn't today. And yeah, it's not going to be that you have right of habeas corpus, all the rest of it, but most of the time will be. We're only going to use it in special circumstances uh, affecting national security. So we're back to charismatic. Right? The people trust they won't use it. The bottom line is, down till today, Israel, just about 99% of the time, never uses its cheating powers, except against Arabs that they suspect of terrorism. You understand? But if they do, they can arrest you in the middle of the night without a trial. It's like Kafka. They can put you in a jail forever. And you never see a lawyer, and they don't have to do anything, and it's legal. Okay? And this is the way Ben-Gurion wanted it, and they haven't modified it uh, that much. So what I'm trying to say is, that they did not go for the United States model, but rather they went for the British model. Okay? And uh, it's not surprising. They'd been under Britain. Uh, England is a kind of a democracy. Oh, it is. Um, as I say before, they don't have the traditions we have of uh, the constitutional limitations on executive authority, but um, it's basically a democratic country. That's how they saw it. And in the middle of a war, uh, we don't want the ACLU. Right, that, that really is it. To be perfectly honest, if you know American history, Abraham Lincoln suspended the Constitution during the Civil War. Uh, we are in a state called Maryland, which was put totally under martial law. We're in a city called Baltimore. If you know anything about the Civil War, the Bill of Rights was totally suspended. You could get arrested. It happened all the time. And they arrest people without trial, kept them for years in a fortress called Fort McHenry, which was a concentration camp for federal political prisoners. And then when the war was over, uh, the Supreme Court declared it all uh, prohibited. 
They said it was a violation of the law, but by that time the war was over, Lincoln was dead, and the Union had been saved. Similarly, you know, of course, Franklin Roosevelt suspended all the rules and just rounded up and put all the Japanese in concentration camps, and nobody said anything about it until 1947, when the war was safely over, and then the Supreme Court said, oh, this was all wrong. Okay? So the point is, every country has its own... Pre and by the way, who... Here's a little piece of trivia. Who was the governor of California that prosecuted the operation and put all these guys in the concentration camp? Earl Warren, right? Who later became famous as a liberal Supreme Court, uh, you know, the Ch Chief Justice Supreme Court. So I'm just telling you, every country has its own particular way of doing these sorts of things. And, uh, and Israel did at that time. Um, I would say in general, not surprisingly, uh, Ben-Gurion and his immediate successors were very afraid of a Supreme Court running amok. Now, that's a loaded term. You can then say they're afraid of a Supreme Court exercising its appropriate responsibility as being the watchdog of the individual rights. That's not how they saw it. Right? They said, you got a bunch of justices, who knows what the heck they'll do, and we can find some Arab that they call a ticking bomb, or some Jew who could be a nut, who could be a ticking bomb. Is it possible to have Jewish terrorists? Yeah. Well, will Israel, in its years, go through episodes, Jewish terror? Y yes. Uh, we don't want no Supreme Court telling us, stop, start, this, that, and the other. Now, whether you, whether you hold they were right or wrong, it depends on your political opinion. But I'm telling you, as a matter of history, that this is the way it happened. And so they never had a constitutional a constituent assembly. Uh, they just declared themselves to be a parliament. And once Ben Gurion put together a government which had 61 or more, then he's the dictator, providing get the other 61 to go along. That's the bottom line. Uh, and so uh, the conclusion of this little thing is that Ben Gurion was not uh, identical with James Madison. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the basic features of this is that uh, Israel becomes a state in 1948. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but some people are here, I'm sure are. And uh, uh, what do you do with the laws? Uh, so uh, they can't start all over again. Uh, they can't say, like, all laws are suspended until we pass new laws in May 14th of 1948. And so what they said, all the existing laws are in, are, are in place until we change them, if and when we decide to change them. Uh, the only law that they passed, I told you this, on May 14th, on Shabbos, uh, I mean, before Shabbos, the whole ceremony, by the way, uh, was just, like I say, last week, refresh my memory, in the Independence Hall in Tel Aviv, literally uh, less, uh, a few days ago, uh, the whole ceremony of doing the Declaration of Independence, 32 minutes, from 4 o'clock to 4.32, because they ain't got to go home for Shabbos. I'm serious, this is true. So 32 minutes, just to read it, sign it, and goodbye. Um, it's interesting. The only law they passed before they finished signing it is uh, suspend the white paper. Notice, any Jew can come into Palestine. Duh. Right? That's what they're there for. But seriously, uh, that was it. All the other laws stayed in the books until Israel, over the course of times, changed what they changed and retained what they retained. The reason I'm mentioning this is they kept all the British laws. Well, the British have all kinds of laws in there. Good and bad and ugly. And uh, one of the sets of laws is what they call the emergency regulations, which are passed by the British mandate when they had the intifada and all this other stuff back in the 1930s and 40s. And we're dealing with what the British regard as terrorism. And so they passed all these counterterrorism laws, as we would say today. And the British in Palestine, I told you before, have no tradition of a Supreme Court telling the executive what to do. Quite the opposite. And so um, Israel has these laws in the books until today. Okay. I'll give you an example. When they kidnapped Vanunu a couple years ago, where some of you know I'm talking about, the guy who wanted to tell him about Demona and the A-bomb, they, they kept him in a, in a cell for a, forever, and when they had a trial, there was like three judges and nobody else in the room, and they did all kind of funny things like that, um, because they can. <laughs> because they can. It's legal. And that's a simple example of the fact they don't want any Supreme Court coming and telling them you're not allowed to do it. Um, today, after 60 years, Israel's had now for the last 10, 15 years a Supreme Court which is trying to be expansive as the United States Supreme Court does from time to time and uh, try to create a constitution through judicial fiat. I would say that the last two chief justices of the Israeli Supreme Court have John Marshall-itis and they want to be like John Marshall who successfully in American history, some of you will recall, was able to assert, even though he had no basis for this, that the Supreme Court gives the final ruling on just about everything. That's Marbury versus Madison. 
for the constitutional scholars over here. He had no right to do it, but as we all know, he got away with it, and ever since then, it's just by consensus, uh, charisma, that if the Supreme Court says something's not constitutional, then it goes. But in point of fact, you know, there's no power to it. Recently, the Israeli Supreme Court is trying to do this, and the government's always worried because they're going to be, quote, unquote, too liberal as far as the Arabs are concerned, I mean, to, put, to put it bluntly. And that's where they're going with all this because the government's position is we need to have total dictatorial power to use when we need it. Okay? And so it's complex. When we say Israel is a democracy, it is, but it's not a democracy exactly the way we understand it in the American uh, context. Uh, Ben-Gurion's attitude was, he said, like, he said, I had a long conference with this guy. I don't know if it's true or not. Let's go to the next one. It was Felix Frankfurter, who was a Zionist, and of course was a famous Supreme Court justice. And Frankfurter uh, told him in 1949 or 1950 thereabouts, he said, take it slow. Right? He said, follow the British model. Uh, Frankfurt, even though he, Frankfurt was an American chief, uh, was Supreme Court justice, he was a great admirer of the British system. And uh, at least Ben-Gurion said this, that Frankfurter told him, he says, take it as you go. Because Israel is born under crazy circumstances, the middle of a war, and... Um, as a, you know, a, a uh, hard and fast constitution may not be the smart way to go. This is totally aside from the question that they would have had to face over there, which is what a position of religion in the country. I'm not even touching that tonight. Now, um, I would also say that his mentor, uh, Felix Frankfurt, his mentor was the famous Justice Holmes of the United States Supreme Court, who is most famous for saying that the, um, the life of the law is experience. You understand what I mean? And that's the essence of the Anglo-Saxon law, which is that it's not based fundamentally on constitutionalism, but based on precedent, going back a thousand years and more. Right? The, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I do know you follow common law, which is the famous decisions passed over the course of many, many centuries by earlier judges, meaning legal theory is great, but when it runs into real life, the life of the law is experience. And, uh, and therefore take it slow and build on precedent. And uh, that would, again, go with the idea of what I just said. It's not James Madison, but it's something different. Now, the new Knesset, which really wasn't a Knesset, but they declared themselves to be a Knesset, right? The new Knesset, all of a sudden Israel, finds itself in February of 1949 with a parliament, okay? Uh, a parliament which is not going to be based on the uh, American or uh, British system of two strong parties, a two-party system, but rather on the, on the continental system, which is uh, very common in the European continent, France, uh, Germany, uh, Benelux, uh, the Scandinavian, and the other countries, which is a whole bunch of little parties. Okay? Well, let's go to the next line. Here, very briefly, I don't want to bore you with this, but actually numbers matter in history. I can't help it. Uh, look how many parties are there. Right? And by the way, look how many got not even one vote. Okay? Because in the beginning, there was no law, as there is today in Israel, that you have to have a percentage or two percentage to count. Uh, and even that they considered uh, scandalous. Let me explain what's going on over here. In the American system, which is the British system, so we have a, a winner-takes-all system. Is that correct? Uh, you can come up with whatever, whatever kind you want, but the tradition <coughs> in the Anglo-Saxon world has always been a winner-takes-all. I'll give you an example. Uh, it was uh, Obama versus McCain. Uh, tens of millions of people uh, voted for McCain. They lost. They have, no, they have no vote. There's no representation of their vote in the final result. But, but it's okay, because next time someone else might win, and they'll be in the other... You know, it, as long as the public goes along with it, it's okay. O'Malley ran against, I don't know, who was it, Ehrlich or something like that. So whoever voted for Ehrlich, you have no... Your, your vote is wasted, so to speak. You have no representation for it. But... Another, tomorrow's another day, it'll be another election, maybe things will change. So uh, that's one way of doing it. Uh, long ago in Central Europe, uh, they, they, the political thinkers found this to be very offensive um, to pure democracy. Uh, all those people voted for this and, and there's no reflection of that in the political system whatsoever? Just because one guy got 50.1% and the other guy 49.9%. There's no effect of that whatsoever in the political system, a very undemocratic whole idea of democracy, according to this way of thinking, is that the final results of the parliament or the government or other should reflect, should be transparently reflective of the percentages that people voted. Okay, that's another way of looking at it. 
Uh, that's what Israel did. And the reason is because primarily the Zionist movement does not come out of England. And the Zionist movement, 99% of it does not come out of America. But it does come out of Europe. Uh, they were used to the uh, German parliamentary system, the Austro-Hungarian parliamentary system, the ones that obtained in other countries, and, uh, uh, and that's how they do it over there. Until uh, this day, for example, Germany is a pretty stable country, but they got a bunch of different parties, although a few have now emerged as big ones, but they have a bunch of little ones. France is notorious throughout its history, especially in these times, and in 1948, they still had the Third and the Fourth Republic, where they had 20, 30 parties, and the government was changing every 15 minutes. There's a famous a funny line from uh, Will Rogers. He said, in the morning I went to London to see changing the guard, and in the afternoon I went to Paris to see changing the government. You understand? <laughs> it was, you know, Italy is like that today, if you follow the news. Okay? Italy's like it, because you have to, that, for better or worse, is the system that the Jews felt most comfortable with in, 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 in Palestine. And so, the result is going to be that you don't have a whole bunch of parties, and so I can't see the numbers, but I know them basically out loud. The, uh, my pie got 46, so you need 61. Nobody gets 61. The biggest number was 46. And nobody was close. But the Mapam got 19. Okay? And then you see the other numbers that are Mizrahi. The, uh, it says the United Religious Front. That means what they call uh, the Chazit uh, Dati, I think they call it, the Religious uh, Front. And uh, that was the Agud and the Mizrahi joined together in one political party. And they didn't have too bad, 16. Nowhere near 46. This is Begin's Cherut, uh, 14. It's just respectable. He saw he get a lot more. That's what it is. Here are the regular uh, American type general Zionists, the businessmen, the bourgeois middle class type of guys. They got nothing. <laughs> they got, they got seven. Here are the Yekas, the Progressive Party, the German Jews who immigrated to Palestine. They made their own Yekesha party. That's what it really is. Uh, Pinchas Rosen, Rosenblum. You know that, 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 that's what that's what it was. And these are the main uh, th these are the main ones over there. Um, this was a little group from well, from the police minister we'll talk about over here. This is the Communist Party, Maki, the flag of the Communist Israeli. So the Communist Party is for uh, all the way through. They'll have these small numbers, but they uh, make a lot of noise. And uh, I just have one or two more to do. This and this th this particular they end up with two. What is the democratic list of Nazareth? What is that all about? Well, it's Arab party, but w w what is the meaning of an Arab party? That's something we're going to speak about tonight. Um, as you see over here, there's not two parties, there's a whole bunch. If you're going to if you're going to put together a, a, ca a government, you have to have 61. So uh, there's a lot of ways Ben Gurion can go. He's got 46, and he could, for example, for example, he could simply hook up with the uh, next one, the Mapam party, which is also socialist, and 46 and 19, you're home free. Right? Then you have two, a government of two parties, be very homogeneous, be all socialists, everything should be hunky dory. He did not do that, he did not want to do it, as we'll see in a minute. Okay? Um, it's also true, before I go down the line, that the whole country, and this is true till today, is considered one district. So it doesn't matter where you live, it's all one central pot. And, uh, you know, I mean, if you get 50 votes here, 10 votes there, uh, north, south, east, west, they're all uh, counted up as one. And what that meant, once again, is that they're not going to follow the American or British style, in which you have single member districts. And so, you're my re you know, member of parliament for this district. I have somebody to talk to. If I have trouble with the uh, mail or trouble with the, the bureaucracy, I have my local guy. There is no such thing. And there isn't until today. It's a highly centralized one, and Ben Gurion didn't want a local system. He wanted to become Fadrama Cup. He wanted to be at the top, and he gave the orders down. And the local guy just takes it. And that's the way it's been in Israel today with the unpleasant co uh, consequences that many of us are familiar with, which is you're under the control of the bureaucrats and there's nobody to talk to. Um, this is uh, something that people have been talking about changing in Israel for years and years. But I'll tell you, at the end of the day, um, I think I know why, I'm not sure, but I think I know really why they did it. They were afraid, and this makes sense now, that you'll have whole Arab districts, that areas, and they might declare independence or something like that uh, if they have their own little um, area to which they have their own representative. So it's a kind of a tricky uh, a equation, and that's the difference you find in the Israeli reality between the uh, rhetoric on the one hand and the uh, dirty politics reality on the other hand. It's also true 
that they had other messy businesses. Uh, starting already in January of 49, it's the end of the Gucci uh, Aliyah and Gucci Knesset. Everything is nice and Zionist, and it's all European, and it's Ashkenazic, and everybody who's there is basically there because they're Zionists in one degree or another, and they've already gone to Hachshara of one, one, one sort, and they're kind of acclimatized into the political culture of the Yishuv, which is the kind of population that Israel had on May 14th, 1948, as a result of decades-long Zionist immigration policies, better for better or worse, and uh, were, gave them the homogeneity uh, necessary to fight the uh, war of 48, 49 successfully, but we all know that, as I just told you before, now the Agud is on there too. And moreover, now you're going to have tons and tens of thousands, actually hundreds of thousands, that's not an exaggeration, hundreds of thousands of people are going to be moving in from Halak right? You're going to have these people from Yemen, and people from North Africa, people from other places. No, the people who are not coming with any kind of knowledge or indoctrination within the Zionism or anything like that. People who are not Ashkenazic Jews, people are completely uh, foreign to European uh, culture and ways of thinking, and uh, that's going to have a whole host of problems on its own, but that's not what I'm going to go into this year. I'm simply pointing out that the new reality is vastly more complex than the old one. The picture you saw of Ben-Gurion up there, as if that was a Kodak moment. Uh, within a short while, that was not the... Uh, human reality of Israel, which is much more variegated and becomes increasingly variegated as time goes on. Um, I would say that was one of the existential problems that Israel had in its first years, and they didn't do that great of a job of it, but like I say, that's not something that I'm going to go into right now. In addition to that, another gigantic mess, which is there until today, is the business of sorting out the responsibilities between the old and the new, the new Israeli government, which is now being set up, and the Sachnut the Jewish Agency of the World Zionist Organization. Theoretically, on a normal system, what should be like this. Now that Israel became a state, Zionism as an official movement should go out of business. By that I mean, I don't mean that people should stop being Zionists, I mean that they actually had something called the World Zionist Organization, which had money, which had offices in Israel, which had responsibilities. I'll give you an example. The Karen Kayemet builds the, the, the trees, other people in charge of the land, third people give out money to these kind of uh, Moshavim, Moshavot, and Kibbutzim, and other groups in charge of sponsoring a Zionist education. What is all that? In America, you, you have the government, and that's it. You don't have some other group working in parallel with the government, and so you have a ministry of education, and at the same time, getting a salary is something called, it could be headquarters might be in New York. It's something like the World Zionist, World Education uh, kind of fund, or whatever there. Or you have a government in charge of the land, but you have the, uh, another group called the Karen Kayemet, which is in charge of the land in different ways, and they get to decide where the roads go to. And the government has to divvy up the responsibilities. Who, who's in charge of bringing the immigrants in? That'll be the Jewish agency. Who's the one that starts settling them? That'll be the government. They do the transportation. Who builds the actual house? The Jewish agency again. You know, it's a crazy quote kind of thing. And Ben-Gurion and the Zionists at that time were totally comfortable with keeping two governments going at the same time, side by side, with keep, keeping two sets of people uh, on jobs. This is the politician forever. Right? Uh, I read not long ago, if you know anything about Baltimore, uh, who is it? Uh, Tommy Del Sandro, uh, Jack Pollock, two famous political or infamous political people years ago. And I'm talking about 1950, though. Know, and Jack Pollock called up Tommy Del Sandro and said, I got a guy, a guy you got to give him a job. And, <laughs> The mayor of Los Angeles says, what's he know how to do? He says, nothing. He says, good, then we won't have to break him in. <laughs> well, that's exactly what happened there. That's exactly what happens in Israel in 48, 49, 59, 69, and so on and so forth. You got, you got some schmendrick somewhere you want to put in, give, give, give him a job. So, uh, uh, now, is it, now, as time went on, Ben Gurion began to see, a decade later, he, he began to change his mind on this. It was kind of too late. It was already uh, stuck in, in concrete. And it's also true that it came from a certain uh, very Jewish kind of uh, caution. And, and the caution was like this. The state of Israel, its legitimacy is not so simple. There are people that challenge it. The Jewish agency was established in international law universally by the League of Nations back in 1920. Uh, let's not be so fast to throw that overboard. You never know when you need it. Okay. So it's a, a very Jewish kind of uh, gullistic mentality. I understand it, but it bespeaks 
uh, the incredible confusion. I myself, I know more about this than most people. I can't un untangle all the finances over there. If you try to look at who spent what and did what in terms of the budgets back in the early years of the state, it's like incredibly complex even to me. And so you can, and, and, and it was on purpose that way. Uh, I have a relative who works for the government who wrote up a report for whatever this person's department was and the, and the boss said like this, you gotta rewrite this, this is too, this is too understandable. <laughs> but if it's true, but anybody who has an experience with bureaucracy knows what I'm talking about. So you have this problem in there uh, from the very beginning and they never do uh, change that. Uh, you have the Zionist movement and you have the state. And there's a law in Israel they passed in 51, I think, called uh, the law of Zionist movement, which defines it as a legal entity that the state is, uh, you know, has a certain relationship with, and they have legal rights and all the rest of it. The kind of thing that doesn't exist anywhere else, at least not to my, to a little bit of the, it existed in Russia. <laughs> what a great model. You had the government, you had the Communist Party. It's kind of confusing who did what. Thus, um, why? But that's what they did. Um, one thing emerges out of all this confusion, Ben-Gurion is the top dog. Right? No question about that. Uh, he emerged, this is his, uh, his, his hour, as it were, and uh, he wants to be the boss, and he does indeed control everything, if he wished to, during this period. Uh, the media is controlled by the government in those days. It was a long time before they, before he, in fact, in his time, they never did let go. Uh, he, yeah, I forgot what I'm talking about. He controlled the radio and the TV. There wasn't any TV, he controlled the radio. So there wasn't such a thing as the government being criticized by the media. Right? The only media can do is the newspapers. Right? But the, uh, uh, you know, I'm talking about the, the electronic media, is government, which is the case in many European countries now until today. In France, I believe, I'm right, in France, for example, which is a democracy, uh, the government controls all the TV stations and things like that. That's how they do it. So you're not going to hear any slashing, crashing uh, business unless you're a member of the elite class that reads the fancy newspapers. A lot of people can't read. And most people read the funnies or the sports. <laughs> Well, isn't that, is it true or not? Okay. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to embarrass anyone over here, but you all know that uh, they do this all the time. You go on the street and you ask somebody, who's the president of the United States? And, uh, you know, you, you get what I'm saying? <laughs> it's always like Nixon, you know? I mean, it's, 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 it's pretty, it is, it is what it is. So um, anyway, he has control of the media. Uh, his party, which had the majority seats, we'll talk about now, what intended to be the, the party of control. And they did do it. And their idea was, we know better than anyone else uh, how to run the country. We're the ones who created the country. Our leaders are the ones who emerged, main leaders of the country. We're the ones who did the foreign policy that was successful in the end in getting Israel. We're the ones who created the army uh, in the end, as Ben-Gurion that did it. Uh, we're the ones this, that, and the other. And therefore, we want to um, control everything. And if you want to do that, then you're talking about Tammany Hall which is what they do. They set up uh, the Mapai Party, Mifleged, Paul Laird, Sisrael, Workers' Party of Israel. Uh, this is a party that excels all the others in local organization. There's a lot of corruption. Once you're talking about local organization, you're talking about Tammany Hall, you're talking about Jack Pollock and Tommy D'Alessandro. That, that's what it boils down to. That's how they ran the country for, for decades. Right? Uh, this is the seamy underside of politics, whether it's Chicago or in Tel Aviv. Okay? And it's all about jobs and all about this and all about, you know, the, the secret uh, uh, telephone call between one and the other to arrange this and that and the other. And, that, and, and they were successful in doing it. Obviously, the ones who were in the outs hate it. Uh, there's nothing to do about it. Uh, they're, they're, they're very successful. And um, they, as I say before, have their hands, as we'll see in a minute, on the levers of all, all the economics and the levers of all the jobs and the levers of all the strategic uh, decisions made, anything involving money or national security. And therefore, they are the ones, if you want to get along, you've got to go along with what they say. If you want to be an outsider and not agree, you will pay the price. You'll be cut off. I mean, notice, then you better have a, lot, a, a million of relatives in Chutz that, that, That's what it boils down to. Um, Tammany Hall is what it is. Uh, the, the Mapai Party has branches everywhere, and they concentrate on uh, do, you know, building up, as they say, the local uh, politics, as every political machine in the world does. You know the old stories where the local boss says like this, nine people voted right, one pe person voted wrong in this building, find out who that one person was. That, 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 that's how they did it, okay? Um, they justify it by saying, as I told you before, listen, we do have elections, but in between the elections, we gotta be realistic over here. You need a strong party that'll fight against all the disintegrative elements They'll try to pull the country apart or take us down, 
and uh, my pie party has to be it. Now, uh, therefore, we're talking about a dictatorship of the Mapai, but he doesn't have 61 votes. So how do you do that? How does one, how does one do it? And he does do it. How is that accomplished? Ben-Gurion does it uh, by distinguishing between essentials and non-essentials. Okay? Very interesting. And that's a smart policy. Uh, what, are we, what are the essential elements to him and his colleagues? Uh, control of the military and, and, and the national security. Uh, the army, the secret police, because they make a secret police. Right? Do you have a secret police in Israel? They don't. The Sherud Betachon Kali, the Shin Bet. And later on, the foreign intelligence services, uh, police, they, they control all the organs involving national security. Control of all the organs connected with finance and economics. That's the way it goes. You'll see, for better or worse, we will control all the money decisions. And they do. Uh, control of key uh, sectors in the national uh, reality. Uh, labor. Uh, in other words, if you're in charge of the labor, you decide who gets a job and who does not. Uh, agriculture, which in Israel in the early years is given great primacy, as we'll see over here. They spent a lot of money on agriculture, right or wrong. Uh, I'm not an economist, but I know a little bit. And uh, this is all subject of huge debates among the economists. Most people say that they didn't make the right decisions. And finally, uh, control of education. Because hmm? education is who brainwashes the next generation of kids. True or not? And uh, you know, they want to give it their spin, and that's what they'll do. The rest are not so essential. I mean, if you have them, you have them, you don't. You don't. Uh, and so the question then becomes, let's go back a little bit, if we can, to the picture of the parties. The, the, the figures, yeah. So here they have 46. So I'll, I'll give it to you plain and brief. Uh, ben Gurion's a funny guy. He wanted to um, have, and he did do this, have two not so consistent uh, policies at running at the same time. Domestically, he wanted a socialist agenda. And foreign policy, he wanted an anti-Russia, pro-American Cold War agenda. That's who he was, right? He was a staunch anti-communist, even though he's also a socialist, very strong socialist. Uh, those who know what socialism really is will be aware that, the contrary to you know, popular belief, the democratic socialists were often the most principled and fierce opponents of communism. Okay? The people came from the trade union movements. Do you remember in this country, George Meany and people like that? They're very anti-communist, even though they were favored a working man. So uh, Ben-Gurion had this uh, profile. Now. That means that you can't hook up with the Mapam because the Mapam party was a combination of two parties, which in those years was a very socialist, no question about that, very pro-Stalin. And the they weren't communists, but they're close. And the reason is uh, they were nuts. This was the Romance period. Well, pe people saw the Stalin they wanted. Okay, this is the great period of the Romance of communism, close or afar. The Red Army justly had gained worldwide recognition for its heroic battle against the Germans. That's a fact. Uh, Russia, look, in our lifetime, I'm looking at people, you remember this. There were, how many people, I'm not going to ask about you, but how many people out there were saps and thought, oh, Russia was oh, a much higher standard of living than America? Didn't you ever hear that when you were young? Oh, there you have good housing and good health and this and that. And the, oh, I heard a lot of times. I don't believe what you say in the American newspaper. It's all propaganda and so on and so forth. You're, you, if you're nodding your head against me, that's because you're, you know, you're, you're, you're not going back far enough. Now that we know all the truth, and it all came out, the Russians themselves admitted, so, you know, but if you go long ago, oh, my goodness, there is uh, no unemployment in Russia. Uh, everything's uh, fantastic. It's a worker's paradise. Uh, and in the 40s was peak years of this sort of thing. Um, Jews are true believers uh, like nobody's business. Uh, you know, we are really stupid as a people sometimes. And, and, uh, and, and, and nowhere is this uh, as clear as the Jewish romance with communism. I'm sorry to say it. You know, uh, now, if you had a parent like I did who actually lived over this, it's a different story. But if you, if you uh, grew up over here, a lot of people, uh, I'm sure, like I say, I would not do this Tell raise your hands. Who's got a parent, a grandparent, an uncle, or a cousin, or somebody who was a strong communist and believed all this stuff totally? People did. Okay? They did. And the Mapam party was a Google-eyed like that. Uh, Yigal alone, Moshe Sned, the people. Now, these are the people who fought the war. The Palmach, we learned about them. Mapam. That's right. 
they were mostly kids from the kibbutzim, and from these kind of movements, uh, fought heroically. True? Lost a lot. I was, last week, as I say, in Israel, one place I went to Palmach Museum, if you ever go there, they glorified, oh, well, there's what to glorify. In other words, it's, you see, the, the heavy losses. Um, they, they poured blood for the state. It's a fact. And they are true believers in all this stuff, in, in all this uh, communist stuff. Now, they're not communists exactly, because if you're communist, you 100% follow Stalin. If you're Mapam, you 90% follow Stalin, because what you say is, Stalin's right in everything except Zionism. Nebuch, unfortunately, things have got communicated, miscommunications. He thinks that Zionism is not a properly progressive movement. One day, he'll get to see the light, and, you know, and he'll realize that we were really good children all along, he shouldn't treat us way. Well. Now, I get it, so it's delusional, the rest of it. Don't talk to me about that if you're talking about the years of 1949-50 down to Stalin's death and afterwards. Uh, the communists never admitted that Stalin was a monster until 1956, when Khrushchev gave his famous speech. Many of you know what I'm talking about, where he basically came out and said Stalin was a monster. At that time, three-quarters of the, these type of guys left uh, you know, that way of thinking. One quarter remained. I, I assure you, they, you know, because when you commit your life to a certain ideal, you're not going to let facts get in the way of the beauty of reality. That's, that's how it goes. At least that's been my experience. Now, um, the point is that uh, he's not, so, so he's not going to have them in the government. Uh, 46 and 14 with Begin, that would do the trade. Oh, boy. Ben-Gurion Begin is fire and water. That's not going to happen. Uh, he views Begin as, it really did, as a fascist threat. Uh, I, I assure you. Uh, Mapai and the General Zionists and these guys, well, uh, they agree with a pro-American foreign policy, but they want a capitalist social po uh, domestic policy. Ben Gurion doesn't want a capitalist domestic uh, po policy. He wants to control the economy. <laughs> okay, he's a socialist, and so that's not going to work. And it's like Goldilocks. You end up with the front parties. This bet is too big. This bet, this one's just right. And the reason is, well, look, it's it's 46 and 16. The numbers tell you everything, right? That gives you 62, right? Now, with the Mizrahi, with the Agoda, then or today, they don't care whether it's a socialist or capitalist domestic policy. They don't care whether it's a pro-American, pro-Russia foreign policy. Leave that to Ben Gurion. He understands better. What they care about is what? Yeah, money for their schools and, and yeshivas and things like that, right? The, the famous, uh, what was it, how does Heraclitus put it? The... Uh, the fox knows many things, and the hedgehog knows one thing. Right? Uh, and we all know, I'll talk about this more next week, set aside two places for this, that uh, you know, that's what the religious thing will be. And because of that, uh, so Ben-Gurion establishes Mapai and the Mizrahi party. A few years later, the Aguda breaks off because of the question of drafting girls, but not until 1952. And even then, to be perfectly honest, if you know what's really going on, they really were part of his government. They just weren't in the cabinet, but they voted for most of the time. You get it? And those deals were made behind the doors. We'll give you money for this, and you vote for us most of the time. All right? So it's kind of funny that for the next 30 years, 30 years, until 1977, uh, the government of Israel will be run by the Mapai and the Mapai Light. <laughs> and the Mapai Light will be the, rel the religious parties of all things. Because what the religious parties really are doing is saying like this, you have a carte blanche in everything except one area. Right? Every religion which matters to us. Uh, ben Gurion figures, this. you're talking about kosher kitchens, you're talking about, all right, big deal. But meanwhile, I get to do the big things. Right? I get to run foreign policy any way I want. The Mizrahi is not going to quit the government over whether Ben Gurion uh, hooks up with West Germany or with East Germany or with Russia or anything like that. They're not going to quit the government if Ben Gurion says, let's defy Eisenhower or let's make a secret alliance with Ethiopia or anything like that. They don't care. They'll only quit the government if it's a question of Mihu Yehudi or something like that. So as long as he keeps his nose clean on a, certain, a few areas, uh, he's a home free. Th this is the basic reality of Israeli politics for the next 30 years. It's, it's kind of interesting. Um, the, both sides had their issues with this. Uh, the religious were promised things over and over again weren't delivered and vice versa, but that's politics. Uh, once you have uh, 46 and 16, so they can add these guys, the Yekis came along also, that gives you 67, and there's your basic government. Now, I'm not finished. Uh, there are what you call the Arab parties, the democratic list of Nazareth, all the rest of it. Um, 
These are Arab parties, which really are stooges of the Mapai. Uh, we'll talk about it in a minute, about the fact of what happens to the Arabs in Israel, which is a very important story, uh, or starting in 48. But, uh, you know, just to jump ahead for a minute, they'll be under martial law, and therefore they're going to vote Ben-Gurion's way. And they'll call them different parties, but they're really there. So it's kind of funny. For 30 years, the heart of his majority is the Mapai party, the religious party, and these so-called Arab parties. Uh, and that gives you your numbers, and everybody else can jump in a lake, and they kind of do. So, uh, I mean, you know, every once in a while he'll make an alliance with this party, that party, but they'll resign, and it won't matter because he can keep going on forever. Uh, so it's kind of funny that Ben-Gurion, who is not religious, uh, ultimately tied his, his political um, survival, uh, it's very successfully, uh, to these uh, kind of religious parties. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, the concessions he was willing to make, he did not regard as essential. Uh, as we all know, for the, the one that's big today because that big uh, long-term impact is the draft exemption for Shiva Bakram. It was a little thing to him. And it was a little thing in the 40s. And it, you know, it wasn't an issue. And even if it would be a lot more uh, to him to get the right and the freedom to do whatever he wanted, foreign policy, domestic policy, and every other policy, was definitely uh, worth it. Um, therein is the famous story of as I say before, uh, you know, uh, Israeli power politics, okay? Uh, the Mizrahi party, I might say, really worshipped Ben-Gurion on the subject of security. Uh, they agree with them on, on just about everything, except religion. There they have very strong disagreements, obviously, and they'll have their own battles, but they'll be battles very sectoral, right? To get another religious school in this uh, community, to get money for Bar Ilan University over here, maybe to get a Hezder system uh, set up over there. Uh, they're very small. Overall, they are members of the Mapai. In other words, overall, they, they agree with the fundamental line of the uh, parties. Uh, this is the golden age, or maybe I should use another word, of Miflak Tiyut, which means party politics. Uh, in those years, I said before, it's all going to be dependent. Somebody just told me today, he says, Father had to get a job, he got the red card. He couldn't get the blue card. The blue card means he won't get a job. You want to get a job with the government, or, and everybody's got a job with the government. It's a socialist country. Uh, you got to go along, right? And you got to attend the meetings. You got to do whatever you got to do. People got to make a living, right? It's not fun. There are elements in this. A famous Israeli professor in 1952 will write a book called The Totalitarian Democracy. That's true. Now, the democracy part comes in the fact that there are elections, and there were, and there are Fairly fair elections. There's as much cheating that goes on there as in Baltimore, Maryland. I know in Baltimore we don't have much cheating, but you know, and, uh, and it's, it's the same thing in those days. You know, there's, there's some of that. That's just about everywhere, I'm sure. But overall, it's basically fair. And uh, have any of you ever participated in an Israeli election? I did. I was actually offered a chance to vote. That's how fair it is, you know. The, uh, <laughs> I declined, but then nevertheless, the, uh, the offer was on the table. The, uh, the point, no, but, but, but there are elections, but uh, once the election's over, uh, it's always the Mount Pai gets the big majority, and then they put together the government, and then you have to just go along, or you can find yourself losing a job, or you can find yourself in, uh, you know, out of this or out of that, or your kids, or it is, it is what it is. So this is the way it went over there. Um, it was bitter resentment of Ben-Gurion by the Mapam party for this. Uh, they said, uh, you messed us over. We could have had a, 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 a socialist state. Uh, Mapai, Mapam, could have created really a, 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 a socialist paradise. And we wouldn't need any other parties. Well, think of it from their point of view. There would be no concessions whatsoever to the religious. Uh, you'd have a civil marriage, civil divorce. Uh, you have the disestablishment of religion as a state like you have in America. Why not? Separation of church and state. Uh, you have no uh, draft exemption for yeshiva. Boy, none. In fact, we can close down the yeshivas, basically, totally defund them. Um, we can also go after the capitalists and just through confiscatory taxes wipe them out. That'll be Karl Marx's dream. Don't tell me, don't look at me weird like from an American point of view. I'm trying to show you how they saw it. You can have a real socialist dream that the government owns everything and runs everything, like Marx said, for the best interest of everybody. And it's also still be running it, but you know, uh, that, 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 that's what it'll be. And you didn't do it because of your, you know, petty intrigues and because you so unrighteously want to go against Stalin, uh, you know, who's your best friend, uh, you're trying to kiss up to Truman, who's your enemy, 
you know, all that kind of rhetoric, very bitter. And, uh, you know, they'll, they'll actually plot to overthrow the country and things like that, some of them. Um, it's also true that there's a tremendous uh, resentment, let's go to the next one, uh, of, uh, let's go to the next one. Go after that. No, no, it's, where's Yari? No, 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 not that. Well, anyway, I'll tell you out loud. Get, no, the one before that. <laughs> Cast the character. Okay, whatever. Uh, the point. The point is that I was going to show you the, the, the leader of the Mapam party. <laughs> Hooray! There you go. The uh, see, there's my watchdogs. The uh, let me put it this way. You hear where they're coming from. We're the ones that fought the war. Uh, we're the ones that sp spilled most of the blood. We're the ones that you, Ben Gurion, sent to go into convoys through the Arab, uh, you know, uh, uh, valleys and to get shot up. And, uh, and now you say we're not good enough to be in the government? Uh, you're the one, we're the ones who actually formed the first Israeli army. And then you fire us all, because that's what happened. You fire us all and replace it with your guys, and that's what happened. Uh, because one of the things Ben Gurion does is he establishes Tzahal, Tzvagana, Yisrael, which means it's a new day, and all the guys who were in, all the guys who were in the Palmach are fired, uh, including, most notoriously, uh, the commander-in-chief, Yigal Alon, who was Israel's best general in, uh, in 48, and was a very good general. And uh, Ben-Gurion says, why don't you go inspect the French army post? The French army give him a full tour, and while he's there, he fires him. You understand? This is how it happens. And uh, he's replaced by guys like Yigal Yadim, Moshe Dayan, Mapai members. And uh, the idea is like this. The army is going to be all under one control. The economy is going to be under one control. I'm telling you, they, they want to do it. And if, and if you come from this background, very bitter. You can understand it. And, uh, you know, independence isn't the happy holiday that people might imagine over there. Uh, the Mapam's idea of socialism was rigidly Marxist. Mapai's idea of socialism wasn't. Mapai's idea of socialism is uh, very amorphous. Um, Ben Gurion used to say like this: Our socialism comes mainly from the Bible. I don't know what that means, but you know, uh, he also said that uh, you know we, we, we want Jewish values, and that's in, instead of talking the usual Marxist kind of uh, talk, but he didn't want to control the economy, and he did do it. Um, as I said before, it comes out in uh, in funny ways. Most importantly, as far as Ben Gurion is concerned, is the Histadrut, which is the large labor union. And uh, when I say large labor union, uh, they're the union that controls the government and controls the country. We have in Israel something you don't have anywhere else, which is maybe the AFLC. I dreamed of it, you know, but it is that the unions are the ones in charge and they tell the management what to do. Now, I'm serious. Totally. Uh, they control the workers. If they say there's a strike, there's a strike. If they say there's not, there's not. And they tell management how much you'll pay. And they tell management who you can fire and who you can hire which means you can't fire anybody. And they tell the management what you'll do with your investments and all the rest of it. What does that do to foreign investment? It, well, it ain't going to happen, right? And the story of Israel, until very recently, really until very recently, was that, that American Jews are willing to buy Israel bond, and they're willing to maybe to give a, a donation. And if you're Meyerhoff, you give a big donation. But when Ben-Gurion or as a Kaplan or these other guys said, why don't you come invest with us? I said, no, thank you. Right? Uh, because what a mess. Uh, you, I'm going to give $100,000. You're going to tell me what to do with the money. You're going to tell me who to hire and who to fire and all the rest. You're going to tell me how much taxes you're going to charge, all the rest of it. That's why I mean, the union is in charge. Uh, to Ben Gurion and the others, they were totally unschooled in economics. I mean, uh, let, let's understand something. None of these people went to college. Ben Gurion never went to college. Golden Mayer never went to college. Moshe Charette went for a year or two. He was a very brilliant guy, but he only went like one or two years to college. Um, across the board, Elliot Kaplan. Uh, Zalman Aran, all the, they were Zionist guys, Eshkol, they moved, you know what it is, you know the profile, they made Ali at a young age, they worked at Chles in some kibbutz or something like that, and they rose up in the union hierarchy until they became machers in the government. Uh, none of them had a college education. Uh, the reason I mention that is because their understanding of econ economics, very uh, rudimentary and very bad, and it's all screwed up by socialist stuff. I'll tell you what I mean by that. In their mind, their way of thinking, the worst kind of society Listen close to what I'm saying. The worst kind of society is one that has inequities of, of wealth. Right? Uh, well, hold on for a second. They'd rather have a poor society where everybody makes the same money than a rich society in which there's a gap between the rich and the poor. 
Now, I understand where it's coming from, but we all understand today you're going to have an economically retarded society. It's going to be held back from what it could otherwise be. But in their way of thinking, this is the old-fashioned classic socialist business, somebody who comes and makes a lot of money is, uh, is, is dirty. A little bit like what they're talking about Romney now. You understand? No, I'm serious. The idea that if somebody is going to be successful in business, especially off the sweat of others, in classic Marxist uh, jargon, that's a sin. You understand? And let me tell you, there'll be many American Jews who'll be brought up in this way, but they'll come to this country, they'll be money and uh, having a shoe store or something like this, and they'll give money to Israel because they believe in this and have a dirty conscience, a guilty conscience, they'll send money to Israel, but they won't invest. Because who can invest when somebody else is telling you what to do? I remember not reading that long ago. Uh, Sidney Finkel members, remember? Right? It's, it's, it sounds like a good friend of mine. Uh, I remember he wrote a memoir, and he, and he, you know, he built up a whole lumber business in this country, came from your, one of these guys from the Holocaust who came over to this country and, and, and did well in business and built up this whole business. He went, he writes in there, he went to Israel one time when Golda Meir was in charge, and they had a conference about lumber, which was his specialty, and he said like this, you're doing this wrong and this wrong, if you let me advise you, I'll show you how to reorganize. She says, you're going to tell us what to do, we tell you what to do. Well, guess what happened? You know, so this, uh, so, so, the contempt for the laws of economics is, a, is almost a definitional feature of Ben-Gurion Zionism. I repeat, a contempt for the law of economics is like a key feature in there, which is why Israel will always be a Schnorr nation through the Ben-Gurion years, I'm sorry to say. Israel will be a Schnorr nation down until today. Uh, thank God the American Jews, the others are willing to send the money. I, I understand that. But nevertheless, it is what it is. Um, it's because, you know, the, the money situation will always be bad until very recently. Um, and all the other things that, 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 that uh, you know, go along with that will be a weakening factor in the Israeli economy. But that's not how they see it. That's not how the decision makers see it. The General Zionist Party, for example, which argues in favor of capitalism, is looked upon as a bunch of weirdos and, uh, you know, horrible people because they're exploiters of the labor and all that kind of uh, 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 jargon. Was all this smart? Mm, hard to answer because, on the other hand, Israel is an exceptional uh, situation, not a typical economic situation. Economically, it makes no sense, especially in the context I'm talking about, to double your population in three years, which is what they do. They go from 650 to 1300. Right? Well, brought in all their refugees from Europe, Got to take them in from Yemen and from the Arab countries. What are you going to do? Leave them get killed? You, you, you understand? Not, not a regular. What I'm trying to say is this is not a typical Adam Smith type economics. You got to be fair about that. Okay? It's also true that, uh, I mean, what do you say? It shouldn't be mass aliyah. It's also true that defense is what it is. Is it with the lousy borders? Going to have to have big defense. And more importantly, if they have whole areas that are abandoned, the Arabs will come take it over. You have to build kibbutzim there. And have put people there makes no economic sense. You'll have to support them forever. We need bodies there. You see? So Israel's situation is not your typical kind of situation. The lousy borders in general make economic nightmares, not just simply uh, military and security nightmares. Um, I don't know. I mean, one thinks that Alexander Hamilton would have done it differently. You know, seriously. Uh, on the other hand, you know, Stalipin had his wager under strong. I mean, that was in Tsarist Russia. I don't know if they were willing to do that in Israel. This is not what they did. And when you throw in the fact that they had the mix-up between the Jewish agency and the government and, and who's in charge and whatever, you see a big mess. So uh, Ben-Gurion's uh, government is, really has these two sides to it. Militarily, there's one guy in charge and very clear. Economically, it's a, it, it's a huge mess. You throw in the terrible uh, uh, shortage of housing. Uh, in 1949, uh, the army still has to be disbanded. They're maintaining a large army, which a poor country can't do. Uh, there's a physical damage at a war place. They're blown up and destroyed whole communities. Think what Yushalayim, for example, looked like after the war was over. Um, all kind of other uh, similar situations. Israel's in a terribly unenviable economic uh, situation. As I say before, the lack of housing is uh, going to be a terrible, terrible uh, problem in Israel. And, and it's, it's, it, again, it's a socialist Mishigaz. I'm, I'm sorry to say this. I wish it wasn't. Socialist Mishigaz. I'll tell you exactly what I'm talking about. The socialist model from the Soviet Union and the other socialist countries, and then in Europe and then Israel pick it up, is you bring in the people and you build small apartments and pay, put everybody in small apartments. The reason I say it's a stupid idea is like this. They need people, and there's no bigger birth control than a small apartment. That's to put it bluntly. Okay? It, it's a fact. 
Uh, if they're ultra orthodox, it doesn't matter, but but they're not. You, you, you know, Russia, Russia made the same mistake. The Russian race, as it were, ethnicity is very uh, low in the numbers, and uh, Stalin and all these guys were just stupid in the way they did it. If you want to encourage a large population, Israel's a tiny country against the whole Arab world. Then you have to build big houses for everybody. It's, it sounds funny, but it's true. Um, if they would do that, by the way, uh, they would save themselves a lot of um, juvenile delinquency and other kind of social problems. That I'll go into some future occasions. That's not the way they do it. That's not what they wish to do. They consider building a house for people to be decadence, a capitalism. There's something uh, emotionally wrong with it. They're crazy, but that's, that's what it was. And it's really um, a pity because the middle of the 20th century, 1948, 50, and all this, is the golden age of the Meyerhoff types. That's when all across the United States, uh, Jewish entrepreneurs are stepping forward and building unprecedented experience in, 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 in residential housing all across the country. Levittown, uh, Raymond Epstein in Chicago, I mean, you know, whole cities are springing up for millions and millions of people in this country. You, you all know this. Uh, if I say Meyerhoff in Baltimore, that's good enough. And they all went to Binger and said, we'll show you how to do it. And he said, I guess you don't tell us, we tell you. Okay? you know, give us your investment and we'll tell you how to do the money. There's a terrible shortage of food. Not surprisingly, the war was just on, the Arab farms were wrecked, the Jewish farms were wrecked. Israel will have food shortages um, for years. Okay? And again, they don't want to do it in the capitalist way, and so it's going to have to be done differently, and it'll be just a problem. Uh, pretty soon, and we're not going to cover this now, Dov Yosef, who's uh, one of the figures over there, that, that fellow, will become Ben Gurion's minister of rationing, and they'll put in a, black, uh, you know, a, a strict rationing system, which, of course, we all know works great with Jews, right? First thing they do is going to make a black market system, we call it the Tena, and that's unhealthy economy. And many of uh, you who are my age and older, we all remember before Begin, there was two ways of, ca of, of changing your money. <laughs> right? Need I say more? Um, it's, it's, it's the worst kind of government control. Uh, the biggest consequence of all this the biggest negative consequence is not only a turnoff to Western investment, uh, here's the worst, a total turnoff Western Aliyah, which just does not happen during Ben Gurion's time and doesn't really happen until today. Uh, he talked all the time about all the Jews got to move from America and the West and come in here. He's right. And uh, when the people come with their experience and with their Western education and with their economic know-how and all that, then they'll really make a, ain't going to happen under the situation that I just described. And he said, oh, you're all wicked and all the rest of it. They're not wicked, they're not stupid. Okay? Uh, so it was a total turn off to Western Aliyah. Finally, the last piece of this picture is uh, the Arabs. Remember them? Uh, the war ended with, I said, screwball borders. It just screwed armistice line where it was. And there was no thought of the future, and there was particularly no thought of the future for the Arab population. And so I'm talking about the Israeli Arabs. Okay. Uh, 160,000 Arabs in the borders to the left. 650,000 Jews, 160,000 Arabs. In 1949, the U.S. put pressure on them. They put in, let in another 32,000 for family reunification. So you're talking about 200,000 Arabs. Another 20,000, 25,000 of those sneak over the border. Israel wasn't good enough at stopping them. And they, are, and they, just, they just come back. And so uh, what's the result? And Atchison... The American Secretary of State under Truman now, he has this big plan that Israel should take over the Gaza Strip and take in 100 and 200,000 Arabs over there. And Israel, actually, Israel was ready to do it, and then the deal fell through. It's interesting what would have been the result of that. Uh, we wouldn't have the Gaza Strip problem, but you'd have the million or so Arabs <laughs> extra, extra in there. You see what I mean? Uh, the Arab part is something they just never thought through. And the reason I say never thought through is, Either you keep them all in or you throw them all out. Don't do 50-50. They end up doing 50-50. This is just what happened. I'm not you know, telling you what I like or don't like. It's what happened. And then the question becomes, how do you treat the Israeli Arabs? And again, it's the Mapam, for example, versus the Mapai. Or Bechor Shetrit versus Ezra Danin. Let's go to that one. Here. Bechor Shetrit in the middle was a, the head of the Sephardi party. Sephardi party, he was for many years the minister of police. He put together the Israeli police system. He had been a policeman under the British mandate. Uh, as a Sephardi Jew, he spoke Arabic. He knew the Arabs very, very well and all the rest of it. And he said that Israel should have a benevolent policy towards the Israeli majority. 
a minority and try to do all you can for them, and so on and so forth. Uh, Ezra Danin was basically what we would call the Mossad, or the Shin Bet. He's the one who put all that together, and he says, I know the Arabs also, I've grown up all their life. They'll slit our throats if we give them a chance. So you can't give them any privileges, but they'll take it and use it to hurt Israel. Which way do you go? Uh, Danin wins. Okay, Ben-Gurion, in other words, backs uh, Danin, and what happens is martial law. Uh, the Arabs in Israel, for the most part, 95, 98%, are put under martial law for 20 years, from 1948 to 1966, whatever that comes out to. Right? That's a fact. If you're an Arab, you uh, live in your town, you're not allowed to leave without special military uh, authorization, and the military can enter your house at any time, and all the things that go along with being under a dictatorial regime. It is what it is. Okay? Uh, not only that, but Israel, facing the problem of a large Arab majority, I mean, excuse me, minority, it's not as big as the Jews who are going to double to 1.3 million, 1.5 million, and eventually 2 million, but still it's not tiny either. Uh, 200,000 will eventually become today it's a million and a half. So I don't know if you know that or not. I'm talking about Israeli Arabs. I'm not talking about Arabs in the Shtachim. Uh, these, they will be uh, subject to martial law and they will be treated as a dangerous minority and the Israelis will use the same tactics that every conquering nation has always used towards its minorities from time immemorial, which is divide and conquer. Okay? Um, the Arabs, as they use as a single term, really, if you look very closely, are different groups. It's the Muslims, it's the Christians, which are not the same at all. It's the Druze, it's the Circassians, if you ever even heard of them, it's the Bedouin. That, that's how it goes. Uh, what shall I say? Divide and conquer, that's going to be the slogan of this guy as I say before, who will implement the Israeli policy towards them for the next 20 years and, 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 and afterwards. And you want to divide and conquer in, different, in, in two senses. First of all, between the different ethnicities. There's a brilliant book, I don't know if you want to read it because it takes a, you know, a strong stomach, called The Good Arabs by Hill Cook, who wrote that book uh, that I mentioned a couple weeks ago. A very uh, uh, interesting uh, book of what really goes on in Israel, not just a superficial sort of thing. And he's just gone through the Shin Bet files of how they deal with the Arabs from 1948 to 1967. And it's divide and conquer. Uh, you try to encourage the Druze to be separate from the Muslims by giving them their own uh, identity. I'll give an example. Israel passes a law which says that under the Ottoman Empire, the Druze are considered Muslim have to go to Muslim courts. Now you can't have your own Druze courts. And have, they're a different religion. Anything that they'll do to be different than Muslim, Israel will encourage. You see? Uh, the Christians is a tricky business because we all know that the Christians would really like it that to get all the Muslims out of Israel, and the Christians would be the only ones over there, but they can't say it because they're afraid Israel might go down the tubes tomorrow, the Muslims will come back and shech them all. So they, that's, the, that's the bottom line. This, 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 this is the Middle East. This is the real story. Okay? And so you can't say what you really mean. You're always worried about what the other one's thinking. Uh, the Bedouins uh, are, are considered like a bunch of sheiks, the Israelis treat them like primitives. They're not primitive at all. They're playing the Jordanians, the Egyptians, and the Israelis off against each other. It's an ugly picture. Um, but Israel does a matter of policy the way the British did it in India and the way the British did it in Palestine and other places like that. The French, you know, Syria today has all these ethnic problems because the French played one ethnic group off against the other. That is what one does when one is in a, a, a situation of colonial power. Uh, it, it, not only that, it gets even worse or better, depending how you look at it, uh, in the individual towns. The secret police, the Israeli Shin Bet, will compile files on who likes who, who doesn't like who. And just like A.J. Edgar Hoover uses to bust up the KKK, so they'll use it over there to say, oh, this guy's causing trouble. We'll get him fired from the job, get this one in there, tell his wife that this one doesn't do this, and make a whole argument in the village. And that way they won't have time to attack Israel. So uh, these are the realities over there. And they reflect the fact that there is an abnormal situation involving the Israeli Arabs which is a problem we have till today. We just don't like to think about it. When you go to Israel, I dare say 99.9% .9 of us go to the Jewish places. You don't go to Arab villages and places like that, but they're there. And they're majority of the, uh, the Galilee, for example. Uh, yeah, but, you know, it's, a, it's more, <laughs> life is hard enough as it is. And so you don't pay attention, but they're there. Okay? Do you educate them? Big problem. If you educate them, then you create an intelligentsia, which is going to be anti-Israel, and they'll Go for Nasser and the other Arab nationalists who are constantly uh, heating up to go against Israel. Or do you keep them uh, down in the form and dumb? Right? Which is very anti-progressive. Uh, how, how does one uh, do this? Um, what do you do in terms of who's to be the school teachers? 
do you want do, do you want a guy who's going to be teaching the kids and to be anti-Israel and be pro-Arab nationalist, or do you want to make sure that uh, they spy on every single teacher? And so if anybody says anything wrong, get them fired and put in someone else who won't be like, hey, yeah. it. It's not fun, and it's uh, nevertheless there are no good answers. Let's put it this way. That's half the problem. The other half of the problem is with Israel's border. How are you going to keep the return the old Arabs who were out kicked out from coming back? It's basically almost impossible. And Ben Gurion will set up a shoot to kill policy. That's what happens. Thousands, I repeat, thousands of Arabs, Palestinian Arabs, will be shot by the Israelis in the next 10 years or so, or yeah, about next 10 years, of trying to get back in because the infiltration is a Polshim. And uh, you say this is cruel, and it is cruel. Uh, but if you don't, what do you do? Now, it's very interesting. Israel does not want in those years to do what they might have done, which is to build a separation fence, which they've done recently. Uh, the reason they want to do that is mental. Uh, that means that we can't invade this territory either. And in the 40s and the early 50s, they're thinking of taking that over. So it's all a matter of uh, mentalities over here. So to sum up, it's a long talk tonight. Um, the Jews win the war, they set up a state, but then the Jews discover the unintended consequences of sovereignty. It's not like a movie you live happily ever after. What happens the day after you happily live ever after? Uh, but that's what they signed up for. And uh, the final conclusion is the alternative is